We're very fortunate to have police officer Ryan Jennison with us this morning. I met Ryan about 10 years ago and a fantastic fellow. And I was, you know, actually surprised he went into police work. I mean, he has a college degree, tremendous career going and switched to policing. Ryan has been with the police department since 2013. Uh, for the last four years, he served as a mental health officer and is currently assigned to the Midtown Police District. Uh, Officer Jennison is a certified crisis intervention team member. He assists the department with new officer and mental health liaison training. In addition, he gets to have fun with those emergency vehicles. He's an emergency vehicle <laughs> instructor <laughs> and a field training officer. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, the UW River Falls. Uh, Ryan, provide a little bit more about yourself. Why in the devil did you get into policing? <laughs> well, I was uh, in sales for, for many years, and I always wanted to be a police officer. I reached an age where I thought that I was too old. Um, we're, we're fortunate in Madison that they really look for individuals with varying backgrounds, um, degrees. Um, I don't have a, a background or a degree in um, criminal justice, and I was fortunate that um, the Madison Police Department was open to look at people with, with varying backgrounds. And so, yeah, in uh, 2013, I made a, the significant career change to go from sales into being a police officer. Um, I joined the mental health team because I have, like, like many of us, um, family, very close family members with significant uh, mental illness and it was always something that I was very passionate about. So early on in my policing career, I started going to just about every training, additional training that I could on mental health. Um, I joined the mental health team in 2014. I served as a liaison, which is a patrol officer that takes additional training in response to additional calls. And in 2015, uh, then Chief Koval started our mental health unit where he pulled five patrol officers out of patrol and made them full-time mental health officers. And in 2017, I was fortunate that um, I was hired as a mental health officer, excuse me, 2016, I was hired as a mental health officer out of the West District. Um, so right now that there are six police districts, there's actually six mental health officers now. That's our full-time job is mental health calls. Just to kind of give you a, you know, idea of the scope of the number of mental health calls in the city. Um, last year, Madison police responded to about around 250,000 police calls. We estimate about 12% of those are mental health related. So it's a very high volume of calls when you're considering there's, you know, on any given day, approximately 50 calls with some piece aspect of mental health to it. So obviously there's not enough mental health officers to respond to all of those. So we rely on our frontline patrol officers actually to respond to a majority of those. We're fortunate in Madison that our mental health training is approximately double what the state requires. When our first recruits come out of the academy, they have approximately 100 to 120 hours of mental health training. So we are very fortunate that we have um, leadership within our department that really takes it seriously and wants to provide all officers going on the street with a heavy dose of mental health crisis type training. So um, yeah, so that's, I guess, a, a little bit about me. Um, I, I can uh, kick off into the, the presentation here. I did a, a presentation very similar to this back in January to the Crisis Stabilization Conference. So if any of you attended that, you'll see a lot of the, the same types of um, things being presented. This, this presentation is geared very much for caregivers and support staff for individuals that are maybe unable to care for themselves, might live in a um, group home type environment and really looking at ways that police and the community and caregivers can partner to provide 
the best possible type of care if we have an individual that is likely to you know reach reach a crisis so again if you have questions as i'm going through this by all means don't hesitate to ask um, i always um, like to say that as a as a department our beliefs are that unfortunately local law enforcement will always have some level of involvement in responding to these calls and our current reality is that there is an ever-increasing need for support providers um, and as long as there are individuals going into crisis unfortunately local law enforcement intervention is going to be increased significantly okay what will we be discussing today the expectations and general duties of today's law enforcement officer what's the role of law enforcement responding to crises experienced by adults living in a supported living environment and why collaboration is is critical um, what does that typical law enforcement response look like when someone's in in crisis and i i want to what i'm going to show is just what it looks like from our perspective. I think that's helpful. A lot of times um, I'll get follow-up calls from support staff like, well, why did patrol respond in a certain way? And I think it's helpful just to kind of understand the information that we're given. It helps kind of explain why we, res why we respond the way we do and what we can do to improve that response. And then how can we partner to reach that best possible resolution what are some things that we can do both small and big to help that individual that you're trying to support or trying to help your loved one in need like i i said that and just to give you an indication um, right now in the city of madison there is oh i think we're just under 500 uniformed officers um, we've had quite a bit of a number of retirements and office turnover over the last few years. So our patrol staff is rather young, um, rather inexperienced. Just to give you an indication that when uh, we have a, a, let's see, we in our academy currently, we have about 50 officers that are in the academy. They're going to be hitting the street solo as of about February 1st of 2021. When they hit the street solo at that time, about over just over half maybe about 60 percent of our patrol staff are going to have less than three years of experience when they start so there's not a lot especially on some of those afternoon shifts and some of those evening shifts we don't have officers that have a lot of years of experience behind them and these officers have a lot of different roles to fill um, obviously responding to crime scenes where there's damage Officers respond to domestic violence complaints, um, burglary, neighbor trouble, OWIs, car crashes, homicides, drug trafficking, fights, fraud, directing traffic. <laughs> I like that one, uh, theft. Um, unfortunately, um, in our community right now, we have a heroin epidemic, so we respond to quite a bit of overdoses. Um, unfortunately, also, we, as a lot of you people that live in Madison know, we're experiencing a rash of car thefts as well. One of the things that I don't even have in here that has really um, been a huge man, woman power draw on the department as of late is the situation with COVID and also with the recent protests and riots that have occurred within the city that has really taxed our department department to a degree that I have not seen in my time here. Um, what I, I The reason I bring all of this up is I'm not looking for pity or anything like that, but it's just more to show that officers, especially patrol officers, are required to be a jack of all trades and really each officer is a master of maybe one or two. Um, like for instance, when it comes to um, OWIs, um, being a mental health officer who 
works um, very few contingency days and I mainly deal with mental health. I haven't done an OWI in a couple of years now. There might be officers that haven't done a, an emergency detention in a couple of years, but each officer is usually specializes in one or two things. So my specialty is obviously mental health. And as uh, Mike mentioned earlier, I'm one of the EVOC trainers. So I train the recruits on their emergency driving. So these officers are equipped and trained to respond to a wide variety of situations. And one of the things that they are trained is that during a crisis, the primary concern for responding officers is the safety of everyone involved. It's very important that accurate information is conf conveyed in a concise manner to uh, 911. And what we have found is that a little preparation on the part of support providers and law enforcement can make a huge difference for those patrol officers that are our initial responders. So what is our law enforcement role? Number one, assist in de-escalating the crisis. So for instance, if we get called to a group home or if somebody is um, has some form of stage of dementia where they might be acting out and they're escalating, we might get called. We're gonna be a help, helping to assist in that de-escalation and providing that primary focus on safety. Um, once things have stabilized, has a crime been committed? Um, if a crime has been committed, determine the most reasonable response based on the severity and the individual. Um, you know, are citations and criminal charges desirable? Would that be an effective deterrent for future similar behavior? Um, but, you know, for us, a big part of it, intent is an, is an element for most crimes. So if we're working and trying to support somebody in a mental health crisis, um, someone suffering from dementia, well, there's probably not an intent element to it. So in those cases, we wouldn't be looking at citations or criminal charges. We'd be looking at other ways to help support staff, stabilize that person and help them out. Are there grounds to take an individual under protective custody for an evaluation for an emergency detention? Um, this is obviously a, 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 a bullet point that we could spend all day on if we really wanted to. And if, there's our, if there are questions regarding emergency detention or chapter 51, I'm more than happy to um, discuss it. But I mean, just to touch on it briefly, in Dane County in Wisconsin, the grounds to take someone into protective custody for emergency detention is a high bar. Um, oftentimes it's, it's not appropriate. The, I mean, just to give you an indication, the average officer hour time spent on just a single emergency detention right now for the Madison Police Department is 20 plus officer hours. Um, usually ends up with the individual, individual being taken to the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. If there are other ways that we can help someone and support them without an emergency detention, we want to explore all of those. That is the, the I consider the last resort. Um, with adult family homes, our experience is that a lot of times it might be just a, an issue with a caregiver or a loved one that might be attempting to take care of that individual. In those types of situations, are there other things that we can do with the physical environment? Um, maybe removing knives or suggesting magnetic locks or are there other ways to make this person secure to get them supported without an emergency detention? So we will do our best to work with support staff um, to avoid, again, criminal charges, citations, emergency detention, but really what we're doing is what is that least restrictive environment for that individual experience in a crisis? Ryan, I had a question come up from uh, an attendee. Uh, yeah. when do you, how do you decide when it's appropriate to use handcuffs? And uh, get, I mean, how do, you, how do you look at that problem? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I get that one a lot. I, 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 the, the short answer is it depends. 
And what I mean by that is if we have a belief that, for instance, somebody is not going to de-escalate and they're continuing, like let's, let's assume it's somebody in a mental health crisis and it's somebody that we believe um, is going to continue to present significant danger to themselves or others, um, meaning that at that moment, we're not, they're not able to de-escalate right where we are and we have a concern that they could do something to further hurt themselves or others at that moment, at that point, yeah, we're gonna very strongly consider handcuffs, just primarily for the folks of making sure that they we can stop the threat to themselves and others. Not to say that um, they might be taken out fairly quickly, they might be in there until, or they might be in handcuffs until we can find some other way to help de-escalate them. Again, it's not something that we take lightly, but it is something that if we recognize at that moment in time, that is our only option to de-escalate, that is something that's going to be looked at um, as a way to reduce the damage right then and there. Okay, thanks. Yep. So one of the things, the next slide I'm going, what I'm going to do is, what it, what does it look like when officers are responding to maybe a supported home or a group home where we have not had contact, where we don't know that it's a group home? meaning we're just getting a call out of the blue where we don't know um, what the situation is at home, which unfortunately happens very, very often um, with some of the deregulation when it comes to licensing, licensing group, group homes in Dane County, we find ourselves in this situation more and more. Um, this is not an uncommon type call where, um, let's say it's a group home situation where, um, Maybe you have you're taking you're taking care of somebody, and um, I'll use an example that has just come up recently. Um, we had an individual that was upset because in the night she had urinated the bed, and she went to her caregiver who was preparing breakfast and said, "You know, I need my mattress cleaned and taken out." And the caregiver was like, "Yeah, we'll take care of it, um, but you need to you need to have breakfast first. Um, this individual that was being supported did not like that answer. She wanted it to happen immediately. So she happened to pick up a knife that uh, was right there as this um, caregiver was preparing breakfast. So caregiver then, um, she was threatened with a knife. Caregiver goes into the safe room and calls 911. So they go in there, they'll call 911 and the 911 operator can hear yelling. Um, and the way it works is if you call 911, it goes to that call taker. That call taker, what they'll do then is they'll type the notes out and the notes will be, subject has a knife, they're in a safe room, they don't know if they're still armed um, and they need help immediately, you know, whatever. So that, that's the information that's gonna go to be taken from the caller by that call taker. What happens then is then that information then goes to the actual dispatcher. And that will be what we call toned out. What do I mean by that? Well, it'll be toned out, meaning that when they send police officers to it, it's actual, it's a tone and it, <laughs> it goes, it's a series of beeping sounds and what that is an indication for all police officers in Madison in the area that a weapons call is coming out. And the information, we don't know that this person is a supported environment. We don't know any of that if that hasn't been provided. But the information we'll actually get is um, 1132, that's my call number, 1132, there's a person with a knife at 1234 Main Street. Caller is locked in another room, unknown where the suspect is at this time. That's the information we have. And so we are we don't know that this is a group home. To us, this could be a domestic incident. This could be an attempted robbery. But many times when these calls come out, that's the information that we have. Um, it is obviously for us an extremely serious high level call. Um, 
there's obviously with that information, we believe a, you know, a fairly significant physical risk to the community. And we are going to be responding with multiple officers, probably a supervisor. Um, you know, we might preemptively ask Madison EMT to start a unit that way in case there's injuries. And we're going to respond with multiple officers in emergency mode. We're going to be coming lights and sirens. And when we come up to the house, if we don't have any information, we're going to be coming with our firearms drawn, probably a shield, establish a perimeter, and depending on the situation, even consider breaking down a door. Because at that moment, all we have is that there's a person with a knife and a collar is locked in another room. And so we will be doing things like trying to establish contact and trying to get some context on exactly what we have here. But when these calls come out, obviously, if we don't have much information, unfortunately, we're going to assume the worst many times. If there are only six of you uh, specializing in this, how do you actually get a call? You as you know the specialist, how, how does it come to you and how does someone decide ultimately, let's call Ryan or one of the other five uh, specialists? So when it comes to these types call, these type of calls, obviously it's a high level. If we don't have any indication that this is an individual that's in a group home or an individual in crisis, it's just gonna go, it's gonna go out to patrol. It's going to be going to them and it's gonna come to them. If, and one of the things I'll talk about as I go through here is, kind of how can we mitigate that type of call to you know customize that into something that's a little bit more desirable and get a little bit better response for everybody but if there's only six of us and we work monday through friday um you know there's one of us usually on between 8 a.m till 10 p.m but outside of those hours and we're not working then we rely on our patrol units that do have that, that mental health training. But we like to say that many times by working with the mental health unit, our grasp can go beyond our reach if we do certain things, which we'll be talking about here. So, so that is what I would say a typical response would look like. Um, what does it look like if we have a chance to collaborate and what are some things that support staff can do to help reduce that high level response and to help mitigate that and work for a better, better possible resolution we and as i go through this we can't necessarily eliminate the need for a higher level police response but we can work to minimize the need for a full emergency response with some if we do certain things so what can we do before a crisis occurs one of the things that support staff and individuals can do is communicate with their with an appropriate law enforcement agency in madison you can contact our mental health unit if you have an individual that resides in or will be moving to madison and the way that looks is if you have somebody that you're supporting based on their history or based on their diagnosis that you are concerned that they could reach a crisis type environment reach out to us and what we're going to do is we're going to start talking uh, we work very close with um, journey crisis mental health we actually have three crisis workers that work in conjunction with our department they actually go in the cars with us so as a team we can work with individuals that are in crisis or that are you're concerned and we can provide more of that clinical piece of it as well um you know one of the things that i always like to share with individuals is that when i was in a patrol um patrol duty for three years that when i would have contact with an individual with mental health concerns it was always at their worst moments it was always when they were in crisis it was always when things were really bad and one of the benefits i have now as a mental health officer is that i have the opportunity to work with individuals before they're in crisis and i get to see them and meet them and understand what their concerns are and they get to meet me when i'm <laughs> not barging through a door when we can sit down and we can talk about what their fears are and support staff and 
answer their questions. And so it's, it's, I'm very fortunate to be a mental health officer because I get that point of view that patrol officers don't get. You know, you saw that list of the, all everything they have to respond to. So unless you're in a specialty unit like this one, you don't get that opportunity to see individuals before they get to crisis or try to get to know them a little bit. So that's really, that's something I really enjoy about, about this, this position. But if you have someone that is going, that you're concerned about that will get into crisis, contact the, your appropriate law enforcement agency. Like Dane County, they have outreach officers that do similar work to, to what we do. Um, what are some things that you can do to help mitigate some of that? Um, develop an individualized police response bulletin, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Is a cat alert appropriate, meaning an alert on for officers that are actually responding? Meet with those individuals and their support providers, safety audit for those for our residents. And so what I tell everyone is, I don't know if all of these steps are necessarily appropriate or needed for the individual that you're su supporting or the individual that you're concerned about, but that's something that you can discuss with your local law enforcement agency or the mental health unit and kind of talk about what your concerns are, where what their history is, and how do you see this going. And then depending on that, then we can work on what is the most appropriate response moving forward. One thing that we do is we want to make sure that the direct care staff is very well prepared and adequately supported. So as a lot of you know that the quality of support staff and individuals in the home can vary greatly. Obviously, we have some individuals that are extremely supportive, care deeply about their providers, and then there's others that just aren't there yet and maybe just don't have the experience that other care providers do. But one of the things that we want to talk to everyone about is if we assume that a crisis will occur, just work on contingencies is a higher level of support at certain times of the day needed to help address a crisis? Um, are there additional people available through the agency or family members that can respond to help de-escalate a person if you see that it's unavoidable or maybe we're on the verge of doing that? Just some of those things that can be done. Um, I if it's stopping it, mental health officers stopping in periodically and getting to know the person, that that's also an option too. Um, one of the things I like to do is I like to put out scenarios to providers and for individuals and, and loved ones and support staff. And we talk about what you should say to the 911 call taker. So. A good example is I gave I gave that, what does it look like if you're a support individual and you have a knife and we kind of role played that out? Well, an alternative to that is, let's say we knew about this individual. Let's say we know that this is somebody that they're easily annoyed and they're likely to, you know, get into a crisis. Well, we talk about when support staff make that call to 911 to say, this is an adult family home. This person has this diagnosis. This person is suffering from a significant level of, of dementia. This is, this is a home where we think that with a little bit of time and space, they can deescalate. I am safe now, but I want officers standing by in case this you know, goes a different direction. If officers have that information, let's say we've already put a cat alert on that address. We have developed that bulletin and that call taker says, I've worked with the mental health unit. We have a, a mental health bulletin on file. Well, then that's a cue to those responding officers, those patrol officers to pull up the mental health bulletin, which can provide that information that can give good details on how the best to respond to this individual that we've just gotten this 911 call about. This is an example of exactly what is provided to our patrol officers. 
Um, basically, these bulletins are used to assist with that initial response, de-escalation and disposition. You can see there on the right-hand column is our police plan hooks, how can we develop rapport triggers and other information. I mean, it's I, I do these quite often um, and I'll say to support staff, what do they like? What are things that police can say to help? And it'll be everything from talking about sports, maybe a pet, um, some pastime that they like to do, just something that what can we do to engage them, get their mind off it? And what are the things that we should avoid? Definitely, definitely don't bring up the Chicago Bears. They don't like the Bears or don't bring up certain family members because there's issues with them. And those those color coded things are specially designed so that an officer who is responding to the home can pull that up and as they're driving in the car, take a quick look at that and be at least equipped with that bare minimum of information to just help us reach a better disposition than where we were if we were just working a complete vacuum. That history column on the left, that's if we have a little bit more time, we have a little bit more of an opportunity to provide more information on um, some of their background and history that we can look at and we can discuss as things slow down and we have a little bit more time to do it. These are very valuable. One of the things I like to put in there is things such as um, safe room in the house. Caregivers are going to be in the safe room. Here is the number for the phone in the safe room. So officers can call directly in. And a lot of times they'll say, you know what? She, uh, she dropped the knife. She's in her room crying right now. Um, I'm gonna come out in 10 minutes. You guys can stand by. I don't even think she needs to know that you're here. Let's try, I'm gonna try to de-escalate this, you know, without you guys. And so if that's the case and they feel comfortable with it and that's what we discussed in our support plan with everybody, if the less that we have to get involved, if that's gonna cause an issue, by all means, we want to, we want to pursue that. That's the direction that we wanna go if possible. Again, what is, what can we do? What is the least restrictive means to address these individuals and the best way to support them? I talked about um, CAD alerts. And again, a CAD is our um, computer-aided dispatch. Um, we can add these CAD notes and tie it to a specific address. So like for instance, um, we get a call about John Smith who um, again, has a knife. Well, now as that gets dispatched, the dispatcher can say it's the home of John Smith. He has in-home support. He has a history of being combative with police. We'll frequently call 9-1 to complain about staff. Um, when appropriate, con directly contact support staff prior to responding in person. So that's many times going to have a phone number in there. So we're going to call in that home directly before even responding. And many times when we do that, that caregiver will say like, yep, he's just upset. Nope, he doesn't have a gun. He was just calling because he's mad at me for whatever reason. No need for you guys. If you're needed, we'll give you a call. Great. You didn't take any. That person is well supported. We know they're safe. We're not coming in, you know, heavy with with six police officers that's going to definitely maybe cause an incident but again this is information that we can do on the front end work with the 911 center to again preload this information to work to really reach that best possible resolution Many Brian, times I have, individuals oh i have ahead. a real quick question here from another attendee it says uh is the mental health bulletin something that all law enforcement use or one that is uh, strictly uh, for Dane County? It's something that um, when we were starting our unit that we, um, the Houston, I believe it was, no, it was the Austin, Texas Police Department had developed and we developed our, our own um, in response to that. So it is something that like, for instance, that bulletin that I showed you, that is something specifically that Madison Police does that, that format. Um, we are a learning site um, with the Department of Justice, and we freely distribute that to every agency that wants to use it. In addition, we're very fortunate here in Madison that we have a number of support agencies that also will provide us their own specific mental health bulletin as well. Um, and so we will many times take those that information from agencies and we'll distill it into our format just to provide it 
in that method that will give us the best possible way to respond. So no, it's not necessarily something that every department um, uses. However, I think um, each department, if they're provided that information, you can work with them to get some other way to convey that information to them. Okay, I have one other question that sort of fits in here. It says, how do you feel about having mental health calls being taken by a crisis social worker maybe with an EMT uh, worker perhaps? They're referring to uh, the, the Portland, Oregon model. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. Yeah, cahoots. Um, I am very much in support of that. I think any way that we can divert mental health calls from police, I would greatly appreciate. And I know that's a sentiment um, that is shared by many of my coworkers. I think there's definitely an opportunity um, to respond much better to a certain number of mental health calls. And I am very much in support of exploring that model. Um, and I know, I believe in this last city budget, they're they're looking at doing that. And I, I really look forward to getting that program uh, <laughs> up and going. And I, I hope that um, Madison Police can support that in any way we can to make it successful. Um, with that said, my only concern is that because our Chapter 1 statute, it is codified into state law that police have to be involved for an emergency detention. Unfortunately, in some of the high level situations, police are still going to be involved. And I hope that we can look at this um, diversion program that we're currently looking for and is done in conjunction with possibly changing state statute to further um, remove police from mental health calls in a safe way. So yeah, that clarifies a lot. Thanks. Yep. Um, very good questions, by the way. <laughs> um, so again, getting back to the, the CAD updates, um, again, unfortunately, we can't do this with every house. Um, we use them sparingly for specific situations. The um, administrative duties to keep these updated as people move and group homes change and people move around, it would just, it would be extremely difficult. So these very specific CAD updates, we only do them for individuals that are very high level, that there is a high probability of an individual getting into um, a crisis. Again, for most situations, that's why we rely on the mental health bulletins for those. A lot of these time, a lot of times in these, we also will add information on the best way to maybe get in the house. Where is where is a key? What's the garage door code? Things of that nature as well. So, if there is a crisis and we have we want to work this work this in a better way than what we talked about earlier, what can we do? Well, again provide officers with that critical safety related information. Weapons information, what kind, where is it? Keep us updated. Yeah, they had a knife, but they dropped it a long time ago and they are, you know, 50 feet away from it. That's, we wanna know that there's, you know, for instance, there's no one else in the house. There's no pets, no one, I'm in a safe room. Um, history of violence, attitude, attitude towards police. It'll be interesting because sometimes, a lot, Many times people say, well, they love police. They'll feel more secure when you show up. Well, that lets us know like, okay, let's let's try to keep this low key. Let's keep that good relationship. Let's, let's do the best we can. Not that we don't do that all the time, but if we know that the mere sight of us is going to cause an escalation, that's gonna be a look different than if they love police, you know, wave to them and they're gonna calm down immediately, obviously. Um, for that support staff and those individuals, Defer to officers on how much and when to provide information. Um, like for instance, if somebody is, you know, I don't know, has a vase and they're hitting themselves, that right then and there might not be the best time to tell us that they didn't take their medication today, something like that. Um, you might be asked to step away, move to a, move a safe distance, but remain in the area to assist with the disposition once the scene is stable. That's mainly for, um, support staff that are working in like for instance like an adult family home type situation um, 
we've been in situations where maybe we you have a staff member that doesn't have a lot of experience that when police show up they will leave and that's obviously goes without saying problematic um, be prepared to provide that behavioral response plan a crisis response plan including emergency contact guarding information. Again, this is mainly for when we encounter staff that doesn't have a lot of experience and they don't know where that information might be. And so then we're playing catch up and we're trying to figure out what's going on and the best way to support this person. Um, and it's gonna be a lot uh, longer information than if we pre-plan and maybe have a folder standing by or have an electronic file available to all staff members that they can give to police um, on arrival. And if transport is necessary, be prepared to accompany that individual or identify other support people to respond. Again, you know, obviously if the issue and the person is escalated due to a staff member, let's call the care organization, see if we can arrange to have another support provider respond to the hospital to help de-escalate. As we're going through this many times, if it's an individual that's supported by family members as an adult family home, we're always going to be looking for what is the, that least restrictive means possible that we can provide that person to help them de-escalate and remain in their residence. Um, like for instance, if this is somebody that is determined that they're in a crisis and they're unlikely to get out in the home, is can this person safely be transported to the hospital by staff? It, can they be transported by staff with police following? There's There's no um one size fits all this is something that we again try to work out with caregivers depending on the situation really trying to stick to what's that least restrictive means that we can do to help this person one of the things that we consider is that the threshold for removing someone that's in a supported living setting is higher than someone um, in an unsupported setting in our eyes um, when we have that residential provider, they have indicated by, you know, for instance, taking a contract and agreeing to help them, that they're going to provide that adequate support to an individual. Um, well, obviously, if it's someone in crisis, police will always have a role in responding to that crisis. However, we're going to rely on that, um, that care provider to help us with help us work through and support this person, which might be considered a predictable crisis. Uh, now, obviously, as we're going through this, that critical information is, is important. I can't stress this enough. If you are someone that manages group homes or someone that is supporting someone, having that vital information ready and available for police is very important, meaning that the obvious stuff, full name, date of birth, medications, other contact information. That is something that surprisingly is not readily available in many of the times when we respond. Would you put that information into a CAD sheet if uh, concerned uh, persons were to approach you? Um, that's something that, yeah, if someone were to come to us and say, you know, I'm interested in working with you guys and talking to you, that is definitely, we would have all that information in that safety bulletin that we, we talked about. And um, one of the things that I tell the, the, the groups that I work with is have it available for you too, because you never know when you're going to need it. Have it available in a folder. And a lot of times what I'll say is just have it in a folder and put it on a magnet on the fridge if you can. That way, if people respond, it's, it's right there if you can do that safely without being concerned about uh, privacy and a lot of those things. So it's just something to consider. But yeah, that's the information. If you work with us, many times we're gonna have that in the actual safety bulletin. Thanks. Yep. So um, after a crisis, so a crisis has occurred, police have responded. Um, we're gonna, what'll happen is if it's something involving police and let's say, you know, maybe someone got put in handcuffs or it didn't go exactly the way that you thought it should have gone. We're going to, we can, we'll find a time time to debrief that incident and we're gonna talk about it. What are the areas of success? What, er, what areas do we have for improvement? One of the things that I tell um, providers is to request a, cop, request a copy of that police report. You can go to records for a nominal fee. I think it's 
maybe five cents a sheet or something like that, you can get a copy of that police report. And I encourage people to do that just because it'll give you insight, a little bit more insight into kind of that officer's perspective as they came into the scene. And also if you are a manager of a, a group home, it'll help provide additional context and so maybe a little bit information on um, things that maybe you can work on with your staff to improve. And also be able to give you a little bit ability to um, look for ways that police can improve as well as we go through this. Obviously continue working with us to improve that response and that resolution. Again, we just go back to what worked, what didn't. And modify that response and that safety plan from there. Many times, you know, especially when I'm working with kids that need a lot of support, we're constantly going back in the house as they get older, they get bigger, what are some way, how do we have to modify the house to make it safer? What can police do different to help you? And so, I mean, that's, it, it's, it's ongoing. It's never perfect. We're always working on it, but it's important that we keep communicating following this crisis. Um, and what'll happen is as you work with the mental health officers, then what we do is we modify those plans and that'll get communicated back out to those patrol officers. We'll usually do that in email. We'll attach it, you know, updated um, response plans, things like that. So when those office, when those patrol officers respond, at least they can have that information available more readily that we just discussed. When and where would you do this debriefing? That was a question that just came in. It really depends on what the needs are. Um, it, many times it can be, it, it's, a, it's whatever is necessary. I've, for real low level stuff, we might just exchange emails. Um, sometimes we'll have long phone calls. I've had a, you know, a number of phone calls where you know, we've talked it out for quite a bit. If it's a really high level incident, many times it'll be an in-person meeting. Um, depending on the needs, I've had uh, instances where we had an individual that was uh, in a crisis and um, is a very large police response. And we had the opportunity to meet with the individual and his care staff and his family afterwards. And we were able to talk it out and debrief it. And, um, you know, it was a situation where we kind of got to talk about what we did and why we did it. And the individual, you know, obviously was very upset and that it happened but again it, it's I'm, I'm very fortunate that we can kind of customize that to what your needs are and what we think is going to work best um if it's someone that we think that that police contact when we're de-escalated is going to be beneficial yeah let's consider that if, if it's not then we don't need to go there so it's really what your needs are um so again, that's the overview of what I have. I have some, my contact information, also my sergeant available as well. I would say that um, due to the ongoing um, civil unrest as of late, our mental health unit has been pulled the majority of the time to work um, downtown um in the capacity to assist with the protests so unfortunately our availability is extremely limited however my sergeant is available she, if if you have an urgent request she many times can divert one of us to address what those are um so that's uh, what i have and i would welcome any any questions anybody has i've got some more for you uh, ahead, how do how do uh, a contact react uh, to you if you're in uniform or not in uniform? Do you usually wear your uniform? Oh, again, it, it depends. It's I have had situations where someone says is they have a huge issue with police, um, and I'm I'm really afraid how they're going to react when they see you, and you know we'll talk and we'll discuss it, and I'll say, well when are they in their best place so right after dinner you know right before they watch this show at you know 5 30 in the afternoon 
I'm like, all right, well, I'll come at 5.30 in the afternoon. I'll be wearing plain clothes and we'll sit down and we'll talk. And so we'll, we'll do that. Other times, like I said, people like they love police officers. Um, they feel secure when you're there. And I think you should come in your uniform. And so it really depends on what those needs are. Again, if it's a situation where there's apprehension about working with police, a lot of times we will make a visit maybe in conjunction with our um, law enforcement crisis workers, where we're coming in with that crisis worker and maybe they will respond well to them as opposed to us. Well, then they can work with that crisis worker and we can kind of do it through that avenue as well. And, and, and so we, we try to meet those needs the best that we can. Obviously, it, it's not necessarily always going to be perfect, but we have some options available on how we dress and how we respond to hopefully do better than just always in uniform. Okay, another question. Uh, it asked, uh, what kind of training uh, specifically do police officers get in uh, mental health? Perhaps uh, not to recognize others' situations, but to recognize their own. You know, uh, it must be very stressful for officers. And how do how are they trained to uh, recognize that perhaps they're having a problem? Yeah, that um, obviously that's an ongoing discussion. Um, it's something where I would say that I was surprised when I was a police officer that, that that topic was talked about quite a bit. And it's something that we continue to talk about in our in-services, how to recognize um, issues that you're having. I would say that the city does a, a very good job of providing resources for us. Um, if you think that you're having, you're struggling with something that you can you can contact, then we're very much encouraged. And um, I would say on a monthly basis, we get messages from the chief that um, of services that that are provided for counselors to talk to officers if they're struggling and they're having a hard time and so it's it really goes back to uh, you know like for anyone is are we destigmatizing mental health and i'm going to say that it's not perfect but i would say that it's much better and than it, what i expected coming into this career and it's getting better it's better than it was when I started seven years ago, and my hope is that it's better seven years from now. Yeah. Uh, another question that came up, uh, you know, we've been having the big budget discussion here in Madison, and uh, we have a shortage of patrol officers. And as you've mentioned, uh, you're being pulled off of your mental health duties uh, in order to support patrol services. Given that uh, it seems politicians don't quite understand how you know the police system works uh, are you concerned about uh, the future of mental health uh, officer departments um i mean i'm not really going to really comment on you know the budget and the politicians respond i would say that um you know a lot of us i i like I said, I've been in this for seven years. I'm in my 40s, so I had a career before this where I wasn't a police officer. And when I became a police officer, probably the thing that, one of the things that surprised me the most is how much time I spent in hospitals and on mental health calls. Um, I was shocked. And I think as a mental health unit, one of the things I hope is there's a there's a good opportunity to divert a lot of calls from police when it comes to mental health. And I'm glad to see that we're taking some steps doing that. However, I do think that it needs to be done with actually getting more mental health officers, officers that are just dedicated towards mental health calls in an effort to provide that information like those bulletins and do a lot of those resources that uh, mental health officers are available 24 seven on all shifts and on holidays and everything else so that we have uh, patrol officers have that resource available to turn to. Um, ideally, what I would like to see is 
do we have an opportunity to hire more crisis workers that can work in conjunction with police? And the reason I say that is because that CAHOOTS model is very good and I want it to expand and get better, but we're also in situations where police are gonna get called. It's an extremely high level. Um, a firefighter and a social worker are gonna be responding to an individual that's suicidal holding a knife and maybe is in a hostage situation, but police are gonna be responding to. And so anything we can do, I believe, to expand that mental health unit is gonna be beneficial. Yeah, very good. Uh, you probably hate to hear this, Ryan, but it says, uh, I wish all our counties have this kind of uh, specialist working in their uh, departments, you know, so uh, they really appreciate your work. Another uh, from a guardian and a case manager says, uh, doing a terrific job. Uh, they wish that they could expand services such as this in the uh, police departments around uh, the state. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> another, a, little, a little more, a little tougher question though here for you. Last one coming in. Uh, do you have any recommendations regarding situations where police have been hesitant to continue responding to a client with mental health concerns due to frustration or exhaustion? Is this situation, uh, this client uh, had said in this situation, this client uh, has had uh, 51s, though probable causes never uh, found to continue treatment. So I guess I'm not exactly sure. Perhaps uh, the questioner can uh, expand a bit. Um, I, I, yeah, maybe, I, I guess if it's probably, it's, it's very frustrating because we have this image of police that you're gonna go in and you're gonna solve this problem. You're gonna deescalate all of, all of those types of things. And, you know, when it comes to all of this, and I, I know I'm talking to a group where this is, is going to be an echo chamber, I don't have to really say it, but it, I, if it was if it was easy, we would have figured it out already. And these situations are just hard. And I think that's that's probably one of the things that's extremely frustrating for me as a mental health officer. Like, like for instance, when you're in patrol and you pull someone over because they're weaving and you go talk to them and there's a strong odor of intoxicants and you pull them out of the car and they they fail their tests and you arrest them for an OWI. Um, you know, they get picked up by a responsible party or they go to jail and you go back to the station and you do a report. If it's a domestic incident, you separate the parties, maybe one person you find probable cause goes to jail, you go back, you write the report and you go about your day and then the criminal justice system does what they do. If it's an individual that is acutely mentally ill or has ongoing mental health issues where they're right into that that marginal area where they maybe can't be taken care of appropriately by the systems and and that are in place but they're maybe not to that criteria they don't meet the qualifications where they should be having police contact either i feel for those caregivers and those family members that are trying to work through that because it, I, it, I've seen it and it's hard. And there's, again, there's no easy answer. The best thing we can do is continue to talk and collaborate and, and work the best we can. And one last question, uh, how can we best advocate to our local and county departments to hire mental health officers? What steps, information do you think would be the best to follow or have to push as an advocate for more like you? Yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely work with um, NAMI. They're um, very much at the forefront. And I would I would say that I'm very impressed with our county board and, and how they've really stepped up and provided the funding for our law enforcement crisis workers. On the Madison police side, it really is, goes to our local politicians and asking them to advocate for expanding the mental health unit. And ultimately what I would like to see is, although it's, it's wonderful having those law enforcement crisis workers that are funded through the county, ultimately I think really to reach an optimal situation, I would really like to see those positions move to city funded positions. Um, I think we would have additional flexibility. We would have some additional things that we could um, engage in that would be beneficial. And so I would just really encourage everyone to continue to work and support that um, CAHOOTS model that was brought up earlier that uh, where we have a social worker and a paramedic responding to mental health calls, but in conjunction with that, 
work with your um, you know city government and let them know how you feel about expanding that 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 side of it with the the mental health piece of it and the other side is I would definitely contact your state legislature on reforming those chapter 51 laws. I think that's an area that we can really go to and move things along to avoid, I guess, those long, those long police involved transports and custody issues. Terrific, thank you so much, Ryan. I really appreciate you taking the time to share all of this with us. Uh, we're lucky to have you and the other officers in the department and, uh, you know, just, I don't know how to say it enough. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Mike, and thank you to all of you listening and your advocacy and what you do to, to support people and yourselves and everyone else. And I, I, I greatly appreciate all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.